Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to Hackers Toolbox. So today we have Greg and Teresa from Optiver and they'll be giving us the workshop on debugging and profiling. So without further ado, I'll just pass it on to them. Yeah. Alright, uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, thank you for the scattered applause. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm uh, Greg. Uh, I am uh, from Optiva's Sydney office. Uh, I'm in the IT education team, which means I work uh, a lot with our uh, talent team on recruiting and onboarding of new recruits. So actually just a couple of weeks ago, I finished uh, onboarding uh, a bunch of graduates from the, the Singapore office. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to talk about today, obviously, is debugging and profiling tools. Uh, so, uh, if you want to follow along with the code, uh, you can clone that repository there. Uh, can everyone read that? Sorry, the font's a bit small, but I can make it bigger if you need me to. Hold on, let me uh, make that a bit bigger. There we go. Okay. Uh, so please feel free to clone that repository uh, and uh, that's got the code in it that I'm going to be using uh, in today's workshop. By the way, please feel free to stop and uh, stop me and ask questions during the, uh, the workshop, that's fine. Um, happy to answer you, okay. All right. Okay, so obviously we're going to start with debugging. So. Um, uh, is everyone here a programmer? Is, that, uh, is anyone not a programmer here? <laughs> okay, I'll assume everyone's a programmer. Okay, so um, hopefully by now as a programmer you'll have had some experience... Whoa, I have blocked my screen. Uh, you'll have had some experience debugging some code uh, using print statements. So let's go and just quickly have a look at some of the code here. I'll bring that over there. That's going to be very, very small, but we can make that bigger. It's okay. There we go. Okay. Oops. Ah, can't type on my own keyboard. Um, okay. Um, okay, can everyone read that on the screen? Or I can make it a little bigger if that would be helpful. Everyone read it? Yes? Okay, so can anyone tell me uh, what the uh, code is doing? I mean, apart from just what the comment uh, says. It's, a, it's actually a well-known algorithm. Does anyone know the algorithm? I said... Uh, I missed that, sorry. The sieve. Yes, uh, the sieve of Eratosthenes uh, that you've probably heard of. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's basically, um, uh, what it's doing is eliminating uh, every number that is a, a multiple of any prime, basically. So it starts with two, and eliminates any, anything that's a multiple of two, then it goes on to the next prime, three, eliminates anything that's a multiple of three, then it goes to the next prime, five, eliminates anything that's multiple of five, and so on and so forth, until we get to the square root of whatever number we've given it, and uh, then it's, it's done, and uh, it's gonna uh, return back to us all the prime numbers between two and whatever number we gave it, right? Okay, so the question is, does it work? Oops, I forgot to uh, activate my, oops. Uh, Python virtual environment. Did everyone get to install the uh, software uh, that we um, uh, sent ahead of time? I hope so. Uh, okay, let's let's run this thing. If I can type on my own keyboard. Okay, so it's printing out all the prime numbers up to ten, but there seems to be a problem. It's printing out ten. Ten is not a prime number, right? So we need to, to debug this thing. So how can we do that? And of course, the way that every, pro every programmer learns to debug things uh, when they start off is with print statements, okay? So uh, we can uh, add a print statement uh, somewhere, let's say here. Oops. 
Okay, uh, and let's see, it should be eliminating uh, numbers, so we'll just get it to show us what it's eliminating. Oops. Everyone know Python, by the way? Yes? Uh, yep. Is that a no, you don't know Python? Or? Okay, everyone knows Python. Good, okay. All right, so now if we, uh, we run this, okay, it's eliminating things, but it's not eliminating the number that it should be, right? So the question is, why not? Can anyone see the problem? I'm being a little bit uh, obtuse here because the problem, you kind of need to know the algorithm to know the problem. The cursor is over the problem. <laughs> so what does range do in Python? Anyone? Yeah, it goes from the first number, which in this case is i squared, to the second number, but it stops before the second number, right? It doesn't stop at the second number, it stops before the second number. And then it steps by the third number, in this case, i. So the problem is that we need to add one there so that it will not stop uh, at n, right? Just making sense. Okay, I hope so. I'll continue on. All right, so if I run that now, uh, there we go. Hold on, I'll clear my screen and uh, run it again. There we go. It's stopping, it's eliminating the number 10, right? Okay, so we've managed to debug our code uh, using print statements. Okay, wasn't that uh, helpful? All right, now, um, how well do people know C++? Do a few, few people sort of half know C++? Okay, because I've also got some C++ code here, uh, which has the same problem, right? And uh, if we were to, to do the same solution, uh, then we would obviously, we would go in here and we would say, C out, eliminating, oops, wrong, I've got it in the wrong place. There we go. Okay, oops. Sorry, I'm having trouble typing on this keyboard. Okay, so then that would that would uh, add a print statement to our C++ version of this code, and we would then be able to debug the C++ version of the code, right? Everything making sense so far? Okay, we're really, the very fundamentals of debugging here, I'm sure you've all done this a lot before, okay? Any questions before I move on? No, good. Okay, so, Let's start thinking about something a little bit more advanced. So um, another way to debug, and this is especially useful uh, if you're looking at um, programs that have a very long running time uh, or a very large amount of um, computation going on, is instead of just printing something, we can write information to a log file, okay? Uh, and by logging it to a file, uh, we can um, you know, store perhaps large amounts of data, which we can then analyze uh, to do our debugging. So if we look at uh, the primes.py file I've got here, same code as before, but I've added something. Well, the first thing I've added is here I've imported the logging module in Python, okay? Uh, and I've created a, a logger, it's called logger, by calling logging.getLogger and giving it a string. So uh, logging.getLogger, basically uh, what it does is it always returns the same logger for whatever string that you give it as its argument. So whenever I call logging.getLogger and I give it the string primes, I'm going to get the same logger back, no matter where I call this or when I call this. I always get the same logger, right? Uh, so what I can do is I can um, then use that logger 
to log something. But before I do, I have to tell the logging system where to put the logs. Okay? Uh, and that's what this logging.basicconfig does here. So it's basically just configuring the logging system. So I've given it a file name. It's going to log to primes.log. Uh, and uh, I've given it a format. So every log line will have this format. And the format, in this case, may, uh, is written such that it will print out the time when the log message was created, the level, which I'll show you in a second, the name of the logger, so in this case that will be primes, okay, and then a log message. Make sense? Okay, so how do I actually add some logging? Maybe I'll do this here. I'll just go logger.log. Hello world. Okay. So now if I run that. Oops, what have I done wrong? Uh, oh, I forgot to give it a number, did I? There we go. No, I've still done something wrong. What have I done wrong? Oh. Hmm. Something is very, very wrong here. Hmm. Okay, I'm not clear on what that uh, error message is telling me just at the moment, but uh, that was not happening when I ran this earlier this afternoon, so something's obviously changed. Anyway, the point is that it's going to log that to a file. So maybe what I'll do is I'll cut over to the C++ version because that will show us what uh, is actually going on here. Okay, all right. So here's the uh, version in C++. So uh, now here I'm using Boost. Who's heard of Boost? Anyone heard of Boost? Yes? Okay. A couple of people who know C++ have heard of Boost. Boost is a library of C++ code. Uh, that is very popular that you can use uh, in your own applications. You can just download it from boost.org and uh, it contains uh, code that does a whole bunch of useful stuff. In fact, some of the code from Boost has now been added to the standard library in C++. And in particular, it has code for doing logging. So here uh, we can see uh, that what I've had to do to get it to do the logging is actually hash include a whole bunch of files uh, that basically include all of the stuff that we need to do the logging. So when you do logging in Boost, you need a source, which is our program. You need a sync, which is the place where the logs go. And I'll show you how that's created in a second. And you need to tell it what information you want to include in your logs. So let's go and have a look at that now. Firstly, I create here a global variable uh, which is a quote-unquote severity logger uh, called just log. Now, each log message has a severity. Uh, so the severity uh, indicates whether it's uh, a, just a trivial log message that isn't very important or is only there for debugging or whether it's an informational message uh, that is there just to give you information or whether it uh, indicates that an error has occurred or uh, even uh, worse would be something that's, that's critical, okay? So what, the, what we're saying here is that we want a logger which is going to write log files, uh, but it's going to include a severity level with every log, okay? So now we go down here to our init logging function, and here, this magic piece of code here, logging add common attributes, is what adds um, the attributes to the logs uh, that are common to uh, lots of different logging systems. For example, the severity. Uh, we then tell it to set up a sync, which is a file, okay? Uh, and the file will be primes.log. 
and we tell it what format the log lines will be in. In this case, they'll have a timestamp, the severity, and the message. And the last thing we do is we tell it that we're only interested in log messages that have a severity of info or above. So only things that are informational messages or uh, error messages, something like that. So we're only going to get certain log messages. We're not going to get all of our log messages. Okay? And then to actually uh, issue a log message, we use this macro. So boost log sev means boost log is obviously the boost logging system. Sev means we want to include a severity with our uh, log message. And we give it the logger, log, L-O-G, which is the global variable we created up here. And then we uh, give it the severity, which in this case is just info. Okay. And then we give it a message, which is a string, just says an info message. So if I compile that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, was that a question? or? Oh, the compile command. Oh, so I've put a make file there, but uh, you can see the, the compile command on the um, screen right now. OK. Uh, all right, so now if we run that, OK, it prints, it prints out the, uh, the numbers that we expect. But we've now got a primes.log file. Primes.log, there it is. And as we can see, it's got the timestamp. Maybe if I clear that screen and... OK, so as you can see, it's got a timestamp. It's got a severity in square brackets. And it's got the message. OK, make sense? All right, so we use logging extensively at Optiva. Uh, to debug our code and to analyze its performance. And uh, this is very similar to what the, the logs actually look like. We have a timestamp, we have a severity, uh, and we have a message. Uh, and then we can use that information to help us understand what our code did and when, and then debug it. All right? Very similar to adding print statements, so I don't want to go into any more uh, about that. Any questions before I move on? OK, great. All right, now, more interesting than uh, logging would be uh, the debuggers. So I'll go back into this directory, into the print directory here. Uh, and um, debuggers are pieces of software that allow us to stop a running program, or, or pause a running program, and examine the state of that program uh, and uh, try to figure out what's going wrong by examining the state while the program is running, OK? So uh, Python includes a debugger in its standard library, which we can access like this, OK? Python minus m for module pdb, OK? And then we give it our, uh, our script that we want to debug. And now we're in the debugger, OK? So what can we do when we're in here? OK, so probably the, f the most interesting thing to do would be to say, OK, I want to stop the code when it's in my sieve function and then run until we get to the sieve function. OK, does that make sense? Yes? OK, so I say break sieve. Oops, if I can type. OK, and it's set what's called a break point. So when we run our code, it's going to run until it hits that breakpoint. Okay? So I'll run, and then I'll give it an argument. All right, and uh, it's actually, by default, it's put a breakpoint at the very beginning of the code. So uh, it's actually stopped on line one. So I'm just going to tell it to continue until it hits the breakpoint that I actually set. Okay? So we'll do that. And here we are at uh, the breakpoint that I set. So if I use list, the list command, it will show me where in the code that uh, we are. So you can see uh, this is the point in the code where uh, we paused right before this line here. OK? Uh, and you can see the V here means there's a breakpoint on SIP. OK? All right. 
so what can we do now? Well, we can use, uh, oops, oops, I'm on the wrong computer here. There we go. Uh, okay, I can use next, and what that will do is it will step to the next line of code. Okay, so if I rerun list, we can now see we're on the next line of code. All right, I can use next again to move to the next line of code. Uh, and we're on the next line of code. Now, that's all very interesting, but what we want to be able to do is examine the state of the code, right? So I can do something like print the state of the array ARR. Okay, print R, and it's printed the state for me. Every element in that array right now is true. Okay? Is everyone following this? Yes? Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, if I... Uh, I can do just n, which is a shortcut for next, okay? Uh, and then I can I can keep doing that just by hitting enter. Uh, and the problem is it's gonna it's gonna go around this loop. That's kind of boring, right? I don't really want to go around this loop by pressing n all the time. So what I might do is I might put a breakpoint on line 14, okay? And then just continue. Uh, and now it's uh, run until line 14. Uh, we can see the eliminating output there from the print statement that I added earlier, okay? Um, and uh, if I print AR now, we can see that some of the elements have been set to false, okay? So this is what a debugger allows you to do. It allows you to pause the execution of the program in the middle and uh, examine the state of the variables and then... Um, and you can use that information to help you debug your code. Right? Everything making sense? Okay, great. All right, now, um, uh, PDB is part of the Python standard library. Uh, on the, the, uh, the Python PyPy, the, uh, the Python uh, package repository, you can actually download a, uh, a package called IPDB, uh, which is uh, a, a better version of PDB. So I'll just quickly show you that. It's really the same thing, but um, I'll just quickly show you what it looks like. Okay, here it is. So we can see that it's got nice colorized syntax, which is very nice. Uh, it's also got tab completion. If I can, oh, I'll try it over here, okay. There we go, okay, so I've, I've got tab completion here. I can select which one I want uh, and uh, some niceness like that. So basically IPDB is just PDB with some extra niceness added. All right. All right. Now uh, in here we've got our primes program. Uh, so if I have a look at the make file for a second. Okay. You'll notice that uh, in the make file I've got this minus G option. Okay, on the command line. What that does when it compiles, uh, when you're compiling C++ code is it adds information uh, that allows us to work out uh, which line of code corresponds to which piece of binary uh, code in the executable. Okay, and that's very helpful if you're using a debugger because uh, if you're using a debugger on um, a piece of, of binary code, uh, it's obviously not very readable. So uh, that minus G is very important uh, because now we can run the debugger. And again, I will clear my screen just to make this easier. Now, if you're on uh, Linux, you'll use GDB here. I'm on my Mac, so I'm going to use LLDB. Yes? Between GDB and, and LLDB? Uh, yes, but you can you can use them for the purpose that I'm about to show you. That they basically uh, do the same thing. Uh, yes, the, I mean LLDB has some functionality which GDB doesn't have, obviously, and vice versa. But for the purposes of just doing some some simple debugging, uh, like I'm about to demonstrate, they both can do it. Okay. Now, uh, actually, I'd I'd hope to be able to uh, demonstrate this to you on on uh, Linux. 
Unfortunately, uh, the Wi-Fi here won't allow me to SSH to my Linux machine, so I'm showing you on, on my Mac. But the principle is basically exactly the same, okay? All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to LLDB and I'm going to give it my primes executable. Uh, okay, so now I can do something like this, breakpoint set primes.cpp and civ. Oops. Uh, oh, sorry. Breakpoint set. So the LLDB syntax is a little bit different from uh, GDB. But the point is the same. Okay, so now I've got a breakpoint on my civ function. So now I can run my executable. It will stop at my civ function. Here you can see the code. Uh, you can see where it's up to, the arrow points at where it's up to. And uh, we can use commands like n to move to the next line, just like in PDB. Okay, and we can print uh, the value of a variable, and it will tell us what the value of the variable is. Okay? All right. Any questions about that before I move on? Okay. All right. So, uh, yes, we want to cool that. Okay. All right. So, what we've seen so far is we've seen we can print stuff out and use that information to help us debug. We can write logs to a file and use that to help us debug. Uh, there's also tools called static analyzers, which analyze your code and tell you things about it, okay? So in here, in my static directory, I've got some code. Let's just have a quick look. Okay, so what I've written here is just a little bit of Python code, which is basically just going to download some URL that I give it and then run grep on that URL. Everyone familiar with the grep command? Anyone not familiar with the grep command? <laughs> okay, great. All right, so uh, here's my uh, code to, to download a URL and, uh, and get some stuff out of it. So the first static analyzer that I want to show you is PyLint. So this is a, a linter. So it's just telling you uh, some common issues that might prop up in your code. So uh, it's things like uh, bad uh, or variable names that aren't uh, according to the Python standard or missing uh, documentation, that sort of thing. So if I give it my script here, PyLint, there we go. <coughs> it's telling me that the, the module itself, the, the script file, the uh, URL grep.py does not have a doc string, okay? It's telling me that um, my uh, functions that I wrote do not have documentation strings. It's telling me that the variable TMP capital F-I-L-E does not conform to the Python standard for variable names, which is snake case, not uh, 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 the capital letters. Uh, and uh, it's telling me that this uh, I've got an import sys command, which I don't actually use. So I could get rid of that. All right, make sense? OK. Now, if I have a look at this code again, can anyone see any, any more serious issues there might be with this code? I mean, apart from the, the sort of trivial things that PyLint has shown us, can anyone see something a bit more serious? Like a security problem, maybe? Yep, uh, so that's one. It's opening whatever URL I give it on the command line without checking anything, okay? Yep. <laughs> What's wrong with the OS.system? You could, instead of mule, you could pass it in, you could pass it like a semicolon and put whatever parameters you want, right? Yep. So I could, uh, on the command line, I could give it a string, which caused this uh, to execute some command that I gave it, right? So there's some, there's some problems here, some security problems. And there's another static analysis tool that we could look at called Bandit. So if I give it my code here, it's going to tell us about the security problems in my code. So it's identified three, 
three of them basically. Uh, so if we have a look at the first one, just bring it to the top of the screen there. So I've used this function mktemp, make temp. What make temp does is returns a string, which is the name of a file um, that doesn't exist at the time when I call make temp. So what I can do is then I can say, oh great, okay, I'll create that file, put whatever I need into it, uh, and use that file, right? But the problem is that in between when I called make temp and it gave me this file name, someone could create that file and then I would be opening a file that they created rather than opening uh, the file that I, I thought was empty, right? So that's one problem that Bandit has pointed out. Um, uh, then there's the URL issue uh, that, uh, I didn't catch your name, sorry. Uh, oh, okay, thank you, uh, that uh, he pointed out. And, um, and then there's the OS system issue uh, as well. So it, Bandit has picked up these issues for us. So that's a couple of examples of static analyzers which will analyze our code and pick up these sorts of issues for us. Okay, any questions before I move on? Okay. All right. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say about debugging. Oops, I uh, had a slide on debuggers there, but we've already looked at that. What I'd like to talk about for the rest of the session is profiling tools. These are tools that help us make sure that our code uh, performs, or at least work out why our code is very, very slow. Okay. And hopefully, by taking the information that these tools provide to us, we'll be able to work out how to make our code a bit faster. Okay, so the first thing that we can do if we want to know why our program is a bit slow is, to, uh, is we can measure how long it actually takes. Okay, uh, And we can use timing points within the code to try to break down the code and figure out where it's taking a long time. Okay? So that's the first thing I want to show you is how to do those two things. So let's go back here. Okay. So I'm going to go back here uh, to the top level of my Git repository and I'm going into the profile folder here. And then the first thing I'm going to go into is the time directory. Okay? And you'll see that uh, there's uh, a couple of files there. Again, it's our, it's our primes uh, code that we saw before. So here's primes. Uh, well, let's, let's run it first. So Unix has a time command. We can just time, then run Python, and then give it our primes.py file, and we'll give it 10. Run that, and oh, it took very, not very long at all, right? Uh, let's, let's try and make it take a bit longer. Let's add a few zeros on the end there and see if we can get it to take a bit longer. Wow, that didn't take long. Let's add a couple more. All right, now it's taking a well, while. I think I've added too many zeros here. Let's go back a little. Oops, I'll clear the screen. Uh, okay, there we go. That's a bit better. There we go. That took 1.07 seconds. All right, so... The time command uh, is a very basic tool that allows us to tell how long our code takes to run. Okay? Uh, now, one thing that you might not realize is that time is actually uh, implemented by the shell. Uh, so I'm using Z shell here. A uh, very common shell that you might be using is bash. Uh, but the time command is actually inbuilt in the shell. Uh, and so when you run time, you're actually not running a command at all, you're, you're just running an inbuilt thing inside the shell. But Unix has a, a command called time, which you can see in user bin time. So this can be very confusing, right? Because if I bring up the manual page for time, uh, what it's actually giving me is the manual page for the user bin time, not the manual page for the built-in time, okay? So if I wanted to use the uh, user bin time, I could say user bin time, uh, and then I could run my code. Okay, there we go. And it tells me how long it took to run. Now, if I have a look at the command line arguments for a second. Uh, okay. 
and the throw, I think it's L that I want. So if I uh, add the minus L command line argument here, okay, it's giving me a whole lot more information about my, uh, my program. So it's telling me how much memory it used, that's the maximum resident set size. Uh, it's telling me how many page faults there were, uh, that's the page reclaims value. Uh, it's telling me how many context switches there were, there were 19 of them. Do people understand what I mean by these terms, page faults, uh, context switches? Do people want me to explain that or are you happy with it the way it is? Okay, I'll carry on. All right, so that's the time command. But if you want more detail, you can actually measure the time of parts of your program uh, using uh, some code that actually records the time uh, and then prints out uh, how long a, a component of your program took. So here in Python, what I've done is I've added this line here, import time, which imports the time module. And if we go down here, I can actually add some code here. So I've added this line here, start equals time.monotonic. And then this line here, end equals time.monotonic. And then here, I just print the difference between start and end. So it's going to tell me how long it took to uh, run the sieve function without anything else. Okay, So I don't have to worry about it dealing with the arguments or anything like that. It's just going to tell me how long it took to run the sieve function. Does everyone see how that's working? Yes? Okay, so let's... Save that, and we'll run it. Give it a nice big number. Okay, oh, let's give it a bigger number. There we go. So it's telling me exactly how long it took to run the uh, sieve function. All right. So we can use that information to help us work out where in our code we have a, a performance problem. If you take timer points at various points during your code, you can see where it's taking a long time and where it's taking a very short time. Make sense? Okay. Now, question, why did I use time.monotonic? Like monotonic is a weird term to have there. Can anyone tell me why I've used monotonic here? All right, so the answer is that um, the clock in your computer, right, uh, is the, the standard clock is telling you what, what time it is, right? But that clock can go backwards, <laughs> right? So uh, most computers these days uh, synchronize their clocks with some clock service on the internet, some time service on the internet, right? And if your clock is ahead of the actual time, then uh, some automatic process that's running in the background will actually slow your clock down uh, until, uh, or it may even just change your clock, uh, until your clock gets uh, synchronized with the correct time, right? Or maybe you got really unlucky, uh, I'm, I'm from Australia, right? So maybe you got really unlucky and you happen to run your program uh, over the, uh, the day when daylight savings changes and your clock gets moved by an hour, right? So your, the clock can change, is the point, yes. Does it screw up, sorry, the... Uh, it could, yes. Um, but in this case, we're just we're measuring the time. And if we just measured the wall clock time, if we just said, what is the time on the clock, right, uh, and the clock can go backwards, then we won't get necessarily an accurate measure of how long our code took especially if we, we measure the time over a long duration, okay? So um, time.monotonic uh, basically is, is what's called the steady clock or the monotonic clock. Um, that clock never um, goes backwards, right? It always increases at a steady rate, okay? So that is the appropriate clock to use if we're trying to time how long something takes. So beware that if you're timing your code uh, in this way, uh, beware that you're not using the, the standard, you know, what is the time right now, wall clock time. You want to use a, a proper timer like the monotonic clock in, um, 
in the Python time module. And just quickly, I will show you uh, the C++ code to do the same thing. I won't actually bother to run it this time. Here I've uh, included the chrono uh, library. And if I go down here, uh, what I can do is I can uh, take the uh, start time as the studded chrono steady clock now function. Now the steady clock is the equivalent of the monotonic clock in Python. Uh, and I can just do that uh, at the beginning of my sieve function, at the end of my sieve function, and then print out how long it took. Okay? So that tells us um, how long a part of our code took. We can then use that information to work out where the code is slow, and uh, we can then focus our profiling efforts to, to make that particular piece of code faster. Okay? All right, so that's, uh, that's timing points. Okay, uh, all right, where are we now? We want to go back here. All right, so another thing we can do to help us understand where our code is slow is we can what's called benchmark it. So basically, this benchmarking is a more reliable uh, form of, of code performance you know what, I have, uh, no I haven't, I haven't forgotten that. Okay, so it's more reliable, and the reason why it's more reliable is because if you run a piece of code just once, you only get one data point, right? And so if you really want to understand how long your code takes, you actually need to run it a bunch of times. So there's various factors that can actually uh, affect how long your code takes, which have nothing to do with the code itself. For example, was the data your uh, code needed in the CPU cache already? If it was, your code will be faster. If it wasn't, your code will be slower. Okay? Was the computer running a whole bunch of other uh, code from someone else, or maybe yourself, uh, and so the CPUs were all busy, and that made your code take longer as opposed to uh, how long it really takes? Um, so benchmarking tries to um, help us uh, account for these sorts of issues by running the code repeatedly over and over uh, and then telling us how long it took on average or what the distribution of times uh, was like and that gives us a better understanding of how long the code actually takes to run. Okay, so there's a couple of uh, uh, pieces of code that I can show you to help us um, see how this works. So where's my shell? Here it is. Okay, so let's go into bench here. All right, here we go. So we have some code. Um, so I'll just bring it up here. So in this code, um, I've got basically three different implementations of my sieve, uh, my sieve uh, uh, of Eratosthenes. Uh, this one uses the Python array module. Uh, this one uses byte arrays, and this one down here uses lists like the code that we've seen before. Okay, so actually now I've got three different versions, so I can I can see which if of them is fastest. Okay, so the first thing I can do to uh, try to uh, see which of them is fastest is I can use a module that's part of the Python standard library called Timeit. Okay. Uh, so what I'll do here is uh, I'll just run it with minus minus help first so we can see uh, what the help looks like. So here it is. So this uh, tells us, uh, it's, it's basically giving us uh, the time that it takes to run some small piece of code. Okay? Uh, and uh, we can give it various command line arguments like the number of times we want it to run, how many times we want it to repeat, some setup code maybe, uh, and some other stuff. Uh, but basically, what we want to do is we want to give it some code to run, and we want it to tell us how long it took to run that. So if I, uh, for example, uh, maybe I'll import random. So the minus s is setup code, code that will only run once at the beginning. Okay? And now I will run, uh, let's say, random.rand int, and I'll maybe find a random in integer between 1 and 100. Okay, so I'm telling it to import random and then run random.randint repeatedly and measure how long it takes 
and then tell me. Okay, so if I run that, there we go. Okay, so it ran it, uh, what, a million times? Uh, and uh, it's basically, um, it's using, it's broken that um, uh, run into uh, groups of five, and then it's given me the best of the five. And the reason why it does that is because of the variance in the runtime. Uh, so by running it five times, we try to account for the variance. And then uh, the average basically comes out at 200 nanosecond, 207 nanoseconds uh, per, per loop, okay? So uh, that's the, the time it module in it, its most basic form. It allows us to time some Python code and uh, tell how long it's taking to run. So that's great if your Python code is really, really short, but what if your Python code is a bit longer? Well, what we can do is we can say Python minus M time it minus S from test sieve import sieve. Okay, so now I've got my sieve function and I'll run that with some big number. Okay. All right, and away we go. All right, so it only uh, ran that 50 times because if it ran it a million times, it would take way too long. Uh, and the sieve uh, is taking 5.59 uh, uh, milliseconds per run, okay? So it's telling me how long it takes to run my sieve function, given an argument of 100,000. All right, so that's some basic code for um, timing uh, your application. All right, so that's great, but what if we want to compare uh, the, the runtime of different implementations and we don't want to have to type in these Python time it commands every time? So fortunately, uh, the people have thought of this and they've created uh, a, a tool called PyTest Benchmark, uh, which hopefully you installed uh, before you came. Um, who's familiar with PyTest? Yeah, one or two people. So Python has a built-in unit test module uh, to, for doing unit testing. PyTest is a package that's available on PyPy that is also for unit testing, and it has a whole bunch of nice features uh, that the standard library's unit test doesn't have. And in particular, one of the things it has is this PyTest benchmark uh, thing, which allows us to do benchmarking. So let's have a look at the code. Back in my test sieve file here, go down past my um, sieve implementations. And here I have these, uh, these functions down here. So test sieve array uh, takes benchmark as its argument. So this is, this is a bit weird. But if you, uh, for those who don't know how PyTest works, uh, basically PyTest uh, allows you to pass in an argument to your test. And if that argument corresponds to the name of some built-in thing, that uh, comes with PyTest, then PyTest will supply that thing to your test. So benchmark, in this case, will be the PyTest benchmark uh, that will allow us to, to benchmark our code. So we, we literally, all we have to do is we have to say benchmark, give it the name of the uh, function we want to benchmark, give it the argument to the function that we want to benchmark, and um, uh, it will run the benchmark and tell us uh, how long it took to run, okay? Um, now, here I've got an assert line. This is just part of a, a unit test. So a unit test would, would normally have some kind of assertion about whether the code produced the correct result, right? So this, this is just telling, uh, or it's just saying, did the code produce the correct result? So the, the key point here is that the three functions that I've got here, test sieve array, test sieve byte array, and test sieve list, are uh, all benchmark functions. It's going to benchmark the different implementations of my sieve and tell me how long they took to run, okay? And so I can tell which one is fastest, okay? And therefore, which one that I probably want to use if I care about the performance of my code. So the way that I run a PyTest test is I run PyTest, okay? So here we go, PyTest, it's running. Running, running, okay, here we go. Uh, sorry, the uh, uh, output is wrapped around here. Uh, but basically what we're seeing is uh, for each of the different tests that I run, sieve list, sieve byte array, and sieve array, 
here's the minimum time it took to run, here's the maximum time it took to run, here's the mean of time it took to run, the standard deviation, uh, the median time, the interquartile range, uh, whether there were any outliers, uh, and the number of operations. Okay? And the, the 1.0 here means this, this is the standard against the, which the others are me measured. So test sieve byte array uh, was 13% slower than test sieve list. Okay? And test sieve array uh, was basically 2.3 times uh, slower than, than test sieve list. So if I, if I uh, care about the performance of my sieve function, then I'm going to want to use the list version, uh, not the byte array or array version, right? So that's what PyTest Benchmark can do for us, is it can allow us to see how long things take relative to one another. Okay? Any questions? All right, I shall carry on. All right, so needless to say, uh, there's also a C++ version of the same. So if I uh, load my test sieve C++, okay, here again I've got um, a sieve function that uses a vector, uh, and here I've got a sieve function that uses an array, um, and down here I've got, uh, well, I've got one that uses a, a map or a dictionary, so it, there's my three sieve functions. And down here's the code for Google Benchmark. So Google Benchmark is a tool obviously produced by Google, uh, which does the same thing as PyTest Benchmark except for C++, okay? So here uh, you can see it's going to run a benchmark for the, the vector version of my sieve function. Uh, and basically this state here is something that the Google Benchmark supplies to allow us to repeatedly run uh, the same piece of code over and over and record the state. Uh, and so here's the, the code I want to run, my sieve function with some argument. And then there's this weird thing, benchmark do not optimize. Sounds like, why on earth would you have that, right? You're, you're timing something, why wouldn't you optimize it? Well, the problem is the C++ compiler is really smart. Uh, in fact, it's so smart that it realizes we're not using the output of this function. And since we're not using the output of the function, we can save a lot of time by not calling it, right? So if we didn't have the benchmark do not optimize, it wouldn't call it, and so our code would be ridiculously fast, okay? So uh, unfortunately, uh, ridiculously fast, uh, whilst it might look good in a presentation to uh, your boss, uh, probably isn't what we want when we're actually trying to benchmark some code. So this is Google Benchmark. It's actually going to uh, run the different versions of my sieve function and tell me how long they took. So let's give it a go and, uh, and see how long they took. Uh, okay, I think I have to compile it. There we go. Slash test. Oops. Oh, if only I could type. Okay. Uh, all right, there we go. Okay, so what it's telling me is that the... Uh, uh, the vector version took uh, basically about 450 micros. Uh, the array version took about 121 micros, and the map version took uh, about three millis uh, or three and a half millis. So, uh, the, clearly, what we want to do if we care about the performance of our code is we want to use the array version and not one of the other two versions. Okay? So that's benchmarking, uh, and that helps us uh, understand how long things take and work out what we need to improve. All right, uh, I'm told we're going to take a break. Uh, so let's take a break now, and uh, we'll come back in a little while. All right, shall we uh, carry on? OK, so uh, what we've seen uh, so far in this profiling section is we've seen how to use the time command to measure how long something takes. We've also seen how to take timing points within our code to measure how long something takes. And then uh, we've seen how to use benchmarking tools like Timeit, PyTest Benchmark, and Google Benchmark uh, to, to measure how long things take. And, and then we can do comparisons and work out which version of a code is, is fastest. OK? Um, so there are some other benchmarking tools uh, which allow us to sort of take some existing code and just do a very quick sort of analysis of 
how long it's taking to, uh, to run. So let's have a look at some of those. So uh, these are called um, profilers. Uh, so a little bit different from benchmarking tools. Benchmarking tool is meant to uh, just run something over and over and measure how long it takes. What a profiler does is um, intercept uh, the code while it's running uh, at uh, a number of different points and then tell us exactly how long different parts of the program are taking to run. Now that's, that's what's called a tracing profiler. There's actually a different kind of profiler as well called a sampling profiler. Uh, so what a tracing profiler does is it, it essentially says, okay, whenever they call a function or whenever they call a method, stop, take the time and carry on. Whenever we execute a line of code, stop, take the time, carry on, uh, and so on and so forth. The other kind is a sampling profiler. What a sampling profiler does is basically runs your code as kind of a, a black box, but then it, at various points in time it says, right, stop, and tell me what's on the stack at this point in time. Just, just show me what's on the stack right now, okay? Uh, and it just does that lots and lots of times, and then based on... Uh, how many times it saw the same thing on the stack, it measures how long that thing took to run, okay? Do people get the difference between those two different kinds of profilers? Or does anyone want me to explain it again? Hopefully not. Okay, great. All right, so we're going to look at a few different profilers now. Um, all right, so let's find my shell here. There it is. All right. Okay, so I'm just going to go into the profile folder here. Uh, and I've got here uh, some code uh, from our Ready Trader Go competition. Uh, did, anyone, did anyone hear about our Ready Trader Go competition? No? Okay. Uh, it was a competition we ran earlier in the year. Don't worry about it. Okay, so what this is is, is an order book. Okay, so an order book is something that you see on financial markets. And the basic idea is that it tells us whether there are people willing to buy or sell a certain thing and at what prices they're willing to buy and sell, okay? Um, so this code here, orderbook.py, implements an order book and what it allows us to do is, is place an order. We can insert an order into the order book and it will record that fact. Uh, and then if you see two orders which are what's called in cross, which means the buyer is willing to pay a price at least as high as the seller, then uh, what the order book will do is it will match those two orders together and remove them from the order book, okay? So it's a rather uh, complicated piece of code compared to what we've been looking at so far. So let's uh, just have a very quick look at it. So here's our, uh, we've got an order class which we can um, use to represent an order. Uh, it has various attributes like the instrument, which is the, the thing we want to buy or sell, uh, the side, which is either buy or sell, the price that we're willing to pay or, or that we're willing to accept if we're selling, uh, the volume that we are wanting to trade and, and some other stuff as well. And then if we go down to the order book, it's got a bunch of data structures in it. Um, and it's got uh, methods like uh, cancel, which allows us to cancel an order or insert, which allows us to insert an order into the book, and so on and so forth. You don't need to understand this code, okay? I'm just giving you the highlights uh, to show you what's in there. You can re read it later if you're really interested. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to use a uh, profiler on this code. So, uh, oh, one other thing I should show you uh, before I, we use it is uh, down the bottom here, I've just got a, uh, uh, a function that's just going to create a whole bunch of orders and put them in the order book, right? It's just using the random uh, to create a whole bunch of random orders and stick them in the book, okay? So that's all it's doing. Uh, and while we're here, I better just get rid of... I keep going to the wrong laptop. I'm just going to get rid of this uh, profile decorator for a second. Uh, we'll put it back in a minute. Okay, so... Now the first profiler that we're going to look at is C profile. This is part of the Python standard library, uh, so it comes with Python. 
and we basically give it our order book code. Make sure I'm using the uh, command line right here. Uh, oh yes, we've got to sort it. Okay, so all right. So I've run the code with the C uh, profile module. Uh, sorry, let's just scroll back up to the top here. It's a bit longer than I thought. There we go. Okay. All right, so I've run the code with this C profile module. So Python minus M C profile to use C profile from the standard library. The minus S means I want to sort it in a certain order, and I'm sorting it by the cumulative time. Okay, that is the cumulative time that it's spent within a certain functional method. Okay? Uh, and then I give it the script that I want it to run. And here's the output. So uh, basically, uh, the, the first thing we can see here is some built-in thing, some part of Python. Not really interested in that. But the second thing we can see is the orderbook.py. <coughs> and basically what it's telling us is that it spent virtually all of its time in the orderbook script. Helpful, right? Or not? That wasn't very helpful. Next line. Orderbook.py, line 359, function called test. So it spent most of its time in the test function, which is exactly what we would expect, right? The, the test function is the, the thing that runs to place a whole bunch of orders in the uh, order book. So we would expect it to spend basically all its time in the test function. We're not getting anywhere interesting, but trust me, it's going to get better. All right, now it turns out that getting random numbers takes a lot of time. So it spent a lot of time getting random numbers. But we're finally getting somewhere interesting now. Here, uh, we've spent a fair amount of time in the insert method of our order book. OK? So uh, because the test function repeatedly inserts orders into the order book, of course, we spend a fair amount of time in insert. And within the insert method, it's called these methods of the order book class, trade level, trade bid, trade ask, and place. And we can see which ones it spent the most time in. Okay? So it's giving us a, a profile uh, of our code, and we can see where it's spending the most time. Now, sorting it by cumulative time is kind of useful if we care about which uh, methods or which functions it spends the most time in. But as you can see, it's... it's uh, basically giving us useless information that we could have easily guessed, which is that it spends virtually all its time in the test function. So what I'll do now is uh, make sure I pick the right laptop. Uh, I will uh, clear the screen. And this time I'm going to sort it in a different order. I'm going to sort it uh, by tot time, which is the total time that it spends in each uh, particular functional method. Scroll back up to the top here. Oops, there we go. OK. So now we're getting a sense of um, how much time did it spend in each method, which methods were most expensive, or which functions were most expensive. So of course, the random numbers took a long time. We knew, we knew that before. Tests took a long time, of course. Uh, that's interesting, though, that it spent actually quite a lot of time inside test. Not inside something that test called, but inside test itself. Uh, and then inside our, our order book, it actually spent the most time in this trade level method. So now we know that um, most of the time when we're inserting bunches of orders into our order book, it's actually executing this trade level function. So if we wanted to make the code faster, this trade level would be a good place to go first, to make the code faster. Does that make sense? Yes, a few people nodding, good, okay. Um, all right, so that's C profile, which uh, again, part of the standard library helps us um, understand uh, which parts of our code are taking the longest. And I've done it again. Don't know what's wrong with me. Okay, uh, okay, so let's do that. Okay, now, the next one I wanna show you is something called line profiler. Uh, and like its name says, uh, it basically tells you which line of code uh, is taking a long time to run. Okay, so we're, we are able to break down our code um, line by line and tell which, co which part of the um, 
code is taking a long time. Now, in order to, uh, to run this, I need to make a small modification to the code. So I'm just going to go into order book here. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to add this profile decorator to the test function. So what that's saying is that I'm interested in the test function. That's the function I want to see. Okay, so if I now come out here, I'm going to run a script that's provided with line, pro line, with line profiler. So you can just pip install line profiler to see um, to, to install it. Uh, okay, and then I'm going to run uh, those arguments. Let me just check that I'm getting the arguments right. Uh, that's the one, yep. And then orderbook.py. All right, now. Here, it's printed out my code, and it's telling me, for each line, how long did it spend executing that line of code. So, it spent about 1% of its time executing this for loop statement, about 18 or 19% of its time uh, executing this thing that basically randomly selects buy or sell, uh, and probably most of that was in the random. Uh, it spent 11% of its time creating the order, except that it actually spent 30% of its time creating the, the random price and volume, right? So random numbers take a long time. And then it spent 38% of its time actually running insert, okay? So we're getting a line by line output here of uh, where things are taking, uh, or which things are taking a long time versus which things are taking a short time. And actually what we can do is uh, we can, uh, what is wrong with me? Okay. If I actually go to the insert uh, method, I can actually add an at profile on that. And then we can rerun this code. Uh, and it should give me, yes, it's given me uh, not only the test method, but it's also given me a profile of the insert method. So we can see where in our insert method it's taking a long time. It's taking about 28% of its time in trade ask, 32% in trade bid, um, and you know, a little bit elsewhere. Okay, So that's the line profiler. It's telling you which lines of your code are taking a long time. Okay. Man, I will learn one day. I don't know when. Okay, the um, next one I want to show you quickly is the memory profiler. Uh, okay. So what this one is going to do is measure for us how much memory our code is using. So this one takes a little bit longer to run. Okay, here we go. So it's run, and so here if we look at the test uh, function, uh, it's saying that it's, uh, at this point in the code, it was using about 50 megabytes of RAM, and then after it had executed this line, it was using uh, about uh, 53. Um, it's saying increments 0.547. That uh, seems a bit strange. Uh, hmm, that is weird. I don't understand why it's saying that. It should be three, but anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, and then we can see uh, at each line it's telling us how much memory the program's using and um, uh, where, where it's changing. It's probably giving us strange results because it's, it's repeatedly running the code over and over rather than running the, each line once. So that'd be why it's giving us strange results. Anyway, that, that's the memory profiler. It's telling us how much memory our code is using line by line. And so if you wanted to know which part of your code is using a lot of memory, the memory profiler would tell you. All right. I will learn one day. I really will. Okay. So um, now uh, another interesting tool is uh, PySpy. Um, it will generate for us something called a flame graph. Uh, a flame graph uh, basically is a, a graph that shows us um, where the code is spending its time um, in, a, in a hierarchical way. So 
Uh, unfortunately, running this on my, my Mac is a bit of an issue, but I ran it earlier on uh, my Linux machine, which I can't access right now, but I can open up the, uh, the chart and show you if I can get my mouse over there. Uh, is that going to work? Oh dear. Let's go. This is not working. Hold on. There we go. There it is. Okay. So PySpy can produce for us these flame graphs. Let's go into that. Uh, so uh, it's called a flame graph uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, because it's printing or displaying the uh, running time in a hierarchical way where the, um, it grows uh, level by level each time you call a function or method, uh, what you end up with is, is these graphs which have peaks kind of like a flame. All right? It looks a little bit like a flame if you're watching a fire. And so they've colored it orange and yellow and red, which is like a fire, right? So it's a flame graph because it's like a fire. Anyway, um, the point is that uh, we can look at, a, say, a piece of the code here. I will learn one day, but not today. Okay. We can, say, click on uh, a piece of the code here, and it'll zoom into that. And so it's, we're in our test method, uh, and uh, we can click... Uh, a little bit further. God. <laughs> okay, we can click down here and we're in our um, insert method and we can see that the insert method took a little bit of time and then it called trade ask and then that called something something and called trade level uh, and so we've got this hierarchical uh, representation of how long the code is taking um, broken down uh, into to components and into different um, method calls, okay? So flame graphs can be a useful way of uh, visualizing or understanding how your code is working and where it's taking a long time, okay? Does that make sense? Yep, okay, so you can produce those flame graphs with uh, PySpy, um, which is uh, one of the tools that I uh, suggested. Okay, let's see if we can get rid of this. All right. Now, uh, the last tool I want to show you is something called Perf. Now, Perf is a Linux tool uh, that can measure any program. It can measure how long uh, uh, any program is taking. And the way that it does that is it uses some features in the Linux operating system, in the, the kernel, which expose for you various counters that either the, the kernel itself or the underlying hardware maintain uh, to allow you to um, uh, measure things like how long something's taking, how many... Uh, you know, page faults that it uh, had or anything like that. Okay, uh, so um, one of the things you can do, for example, is, you know, where are we? Okay, you can run the perf list command. Now, it's, it's a Linux command, right? So I can't run it on, um, on my Mac because my Mac is not Linux. Uh, but here's the output that I recorded earlier. Uh, when I ran it on Linux. And so this perf list, so if I just ran perf space list, it lists for me all of the things that it can measure. So alignment faults, uh, context switches, uh, the CPU clock, CPU migrations, uh, and lots of other clock, uh, counters and, and uh, clocks that um, are maintained by either the operating system or the hardware. Uh, some of which I'd have to look up to understand what they, what they even mean. So it can measure a whole bunch of different things. So if I ran a command like, um, did it again. Uh, if I ran a command like perf stat, and then I, I ran it on some code, uh, it would give me some statistics about 
how my code ran. So if I ran my order book uh, code, it could tell me things like uh, how long it took, how many page faults it had. Uh, now you see these not supported here. Uh, either the um, underlying hardware doesn't support that or the system doesn't support it. In this case, I ran it on a virtual machine, so the underlying hardware is actually software which doesn't support these counters. But the, the point uh, hopefully you get is that it's measuring for us a bunch of statistics uh, that the hardware itself and the kernel maintain, uh, and we can get access to them using perf stat uh, to tell us um, lots of different information about what our code is doing. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and then I can run a uh, report on my code. Uh, and it will actually tell me things like where it spent most of its time. So I've run it on some C++ code here, and it spent most of its time in get volume. Uh, and then it's these weird things here, studded RB tree something something. If you don't understand this, you're not alone, <laughs> okay? The only people who really understand what all this means are the people who wrote the C++ standard template library. But we can guess that an RB tree is probably a red-black tree. How many people are familiar with red-black trees? Okay, it's a tree data structure where uh, nodes at alternate uh, depths are colored either uh, red or black usually. And those colors are used uh, by the, the algorithm to help maintain uh, the tree in a balanced state so that it has good performance. So. This code is spending a lot of time in a red-black tree, okay? That's what we can tell from this output. That's interesting information for what I'm about to look at next. Okay, so that's the perf command. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about tonight, and then uh, hopefully we'll finish, um, is, okay, let's say you've done a bunch of profiling on your code, you've measured how long things take, you found a bit of code that's really slow, and you want to know, how do I speed it up? How do I make it faster? Okay, that's what I want to talk about now. So what I've got here is some C++ code. It's, uh, it's a lot simpler than the code um, we were looking at in Python a, a moment ago. It also implements an order book, but uh, in this case, it's only implementing one method of the order book, which is this get volume method. Okay, so we're just saying, how much volume is available at a certain price level? So basically, we give it a price, it gives us an int. Okay? That's all it's doing. And the way that I've implemented this at the moment is I've used a, a studded map, which is a dictionary or a, a, a hash table or you know, some kind of associative container, something like that. Okay? So I've implemented this. Uh, it basically what it does is we give it um, the, the price levels, uh, which is basically price and volume. We give it all of that data in the constructor. It stores it in our dictionary or our associative container. And then we can call get volume to get the volume for a certain price. You'll notice that I've uh, given the price here as a string. The reason why I gave it as a string um, is because actually, believe it or not, in uh, financial exchanges, uh, when they send you the price, some exchanges send you a price as a string, <laughs> uh, which sounds silly. Why not send it as a, a double or a float or something you know, that we can actually use? Uh, but the reason why they send it as a string, uh, among uh, you know, silly reasons like because that's how they've done it for years and years, is because you need an uh, accuracy to a certain number of decimal places. And sending it as a string gives you accuracy to x decimal places. right? So here's our, here's our code. It's calling get volume, and uh, it's, a, it's slow. We think, we think it's a bit slow. We want it to be faster. OK? So I've got some, uh, some prizes here. Uh, let's see. We've got, a, we've got a Rubik's cube. Teresa's looking very excited at the back there. Uh, we've, that's a 4x4 four four Rubik's cube. There you go. Anyone here is good at Rubik's Cubes? I'm, I'm terrible at Rubik's Cubes. Anyway, I've got a prize here. So who can tell me 
something that we might be able to do to make this code go a bit faster. Can we use an unordered map? Do you want to explain why we would want to use an unordered map? <laughs> so I want you to have this. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Exactly. So the hint that I gave you a moment ago was that the code is spending a lot of time in a red black tree, right? Um, and the studded map in C++ for those who don't know C++ um, is implemented as a tree. It's actually a red-black tree. Uh, and that's really good if you want to go through the elements of the map in order, but it's terrible if you want to look it up because lookups are going to take logarithmic time on average, whereas a hash table or an unordered map uh, is, is constant time lookup. So it's going to be faster if we uh, use an unordered map. So let's, let's give that a try. Uh, okay, I'll edit my order book code here. Whoops. Uh, slash map. I'm just going to... Oh, sorry. I should do something first. Okay, so first thing we should do, of course, is measure to make sure we understand how long the code takes. Currently taking a hundred nanoseconds. Okay, now is that right? Did I make that? Yeah, I did. Uh, okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change this to an unordered map. how long it takes now. Okay, 8.7 nanoseconds, right? So just by changing from one data structure to another data structure, we've actually cut the, the running time by quite a lot, right? So that's one thing we can do uh, to make it go a bit faster. I wonder though if there's something else we could do to make it go faster. So I have another Rubik's cube here. <laughs> What's something else that we could do to make it go a bit faster? All right, so let me uh, go back to my thing here. Bring that up. Okay, so there's our red-black tree. That was uh, one problem. So now we've got, a, uh, we've got an unordered map, which is uh, essentially a hash table. So here's how it looks in memory. Um, uh, so we've got a table uh, or an array of some kind, and each entry in the array uh, is pointing to a list of values. So when we want to do the lookup in our uh, unordered map, uh, we hash the value, the key that we're looking up. Uh, maybe we get to this one here. And then we've got to search through these three things to find the element that we, we want. Okay? So does that give anyone uh, a clue as to how we might make it a bit faster? Maybe you can make the, the list. The list. Uh, make it, sorry, make it. Uh, so instead of different to the list, we can use an other map to, to search it with one. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So we could use another map here rather than a list. Uh, yes, uh, that potentially could be faster. Um, uh, okay, uh, any other ideas? Yes, up the back there. I'm oh, sorry, I couldn't hear that. Oh, ah, yes, use open addressing. Both, both good ideas. So open addressing, for those who don't know, is uh, where we use these empty elements in the, um, uh, in the table to store uh, the, the missing elements. Uh, and so when we look up a value, we just sort of look up 
uh, things in the hash table. Can anyone say why that would be a bit faster? The cache line, yes. Okay, so uh, what I might do is I might use uh, one of these and I'll run it Okay, so um, that's interesting that you would talk about the cache line uh, because uh, K, the cache, of course, the CPU cache, is a big determinant of uh, performance, right? So what we can do is we can actually try to make our code more optimal in terms of the way that it uses the cache. So rather than type the code out in front of you, I've got it pre-prepared. Okay, so here, uh, what I've done uh, actually is, um, uh, oh, actually that's a different one. Let me uh, get the uh, correct one, sorry. Okay. Okay, so here, what I've done in this version of the code is I've represented the, the map as just a vector. Okay, so an array, essentially. Um, and uh, what I do is I convert my string price into a uh, integer. Okay, and then I just use the elements in, a, in my buffer with the price mod by the size of the buffer. Okay, so uh, as long as the buffer is bigger than the number of prices that we use, this will not Im uh, result in any collisions. Okay, uh, and uh, because in an order book the prices tend to all be very close together, uh, we can take advantage of that fact. And so by putting them in a buffer like this, we take advantage of the cache, and this version of the code will be very, very fast. Okay? Uh, so let's see how long that takes. Uh, make. All right. Okay, so that one's down to 6.5 nanoseconds. Okay, so not as big a, a performance improvement as, as we saw before, but still a performance improvement uh, if, if we really care about the performance of this code. Now, I'm not sure anyone was uh, watching when I accidentally showed you the other version of this code, but in case anyone was, does any, did anyone notice how the other version of this code made things a bit faster? Okay, no one noticed. All right. So, uh, it turns out that in the original version of my code, uh, it was doing a memory allocation. Uh, well, maybe I'll bring it up. Uh, let me uh, bring it up here. Uh, it's Oops. Okay, so here's the original version of the code. Can anyone see where it's doing a memory allocation? Might help if you know C++. <laughs> anyone at all? Yes? Right, yes, I see what you're saying. Sorry, uh, let me be a bit more specific. Uh, what I care about is this get volume. That's the, that's the thing that we want to be really fast. Okay, so somewhere within get volume, it's actually doing a memory allocation. Can anyone see it? Uh, you mean here? 
Uh, yeah, it's creating a pair. Uh, so a pair actually is only on the stack, sorry. So no memory allocation there. But you're very warm. <laughs> yes? Uh, okay, Clo close enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you one of these fancy chess sets. Okay, so, well done. Okay, so what's actually happening here is that it's, uh, we're taking in a string view. This is a very lightweight version of a string in C++. Oh, sorry. Oh, did someone have a question? Sorry. Oh, okay. So a string view is a very lightweight version of a string. It's, it's very, uh, it costs virtually nothing to pass these around, to copy them. Very, very uh, lightweight, very highly, uh, very performant. The problem is that our map maps from strings, not string views, to the volume at that price level. So what we have to do is we have to convert our string view into a string. And to do that costs us an allocation. So we need to get rid of that uh, somehow. Uh, and of course, the way that we do that, I'll show you. Uh, forgive my terrible typing. Okay, so uh, here we have it. So what I've done now is uh, oops, let's scroll down a little. So here, um, what I've got is an unordered map. So we've made that optimization from string views to longs, uh, which sounds like all we need, right? Because what, what we want is a map from string views to, to longs. The problem is that uh, the string's got to be stored somewhere. We've got to actually store the string somewhere, okay? So what we do is we have a vector of strings, okay? And every time that we insert something, uh, we put it in our vector of strings, and then we put it in our map. And uh, now, when we do a lookup, we can look it up with the string view and not by creating a string. So this saves us a memory allocation, uh, which makes our code a little bit faster. Uh, so that's yet another thing that we can do to make our code faster. So to summarize, if we want to make our code faster, First thing to, to do is to make sure you're using the right kind of data structure. If you're using a, a tree map, for example, uh, when uh, what you really need is a hash table, then you want to make that change and it will probably make your code a bit faster. Uh, another thing to do would be to take advantage of the cache, right? Make sure that uh, the way your data structure works keeps all the data that you care about close together in memory and then your code will be faster. Uh, make sure your code isn't doing something silly like memory allocations in a tight loop, okay? Uh, because uh, if it is, then your code will be very, very slow. Uh, so if you get rid of those, then your code will be faster. All right. Uh, we've actually gone for about two hours, and that's uh, all the material I had. So I'll stop there. I hope uh, if you have any questions, of course, please, uh, please ask. Uh, but otherwise, I hope you've uh, benefited from this. And um, yeah. Thank you for having me.